the first show on the People's Internet Radio. Um, they're going to be playing the podcasts from this show also on Awake Radio, where I was for three years. So let me just introduce you. Um, you are with an organization called Reprieve, an international human rights organization that has studied U.S. government drone killings. Um, and your organization has said for three years now, President Obama has been promising to shed light on the CIA's covert drone program. And um, t today he had a golden opportunity to do just that, but instead he chose to do the opposite. He published numbers that are hundreds lower than even the lowest estimates by independent organizations. Exactly, exactly. We uh, we are not surprised, but we are still disheartened by what the administration has chosen to reveal, which is what we consider untrustworthy information that doesn't help us account for the amount of civilian lives. Uh, it doesn't help us um, be able to consider and contradict that information because it comes without identifying features such as names, countries, dates, anything that might humanize these people or allow us to, for instance, take account for the Jirga strike that killed 41 tribal elders. Uh, we can't even consider whether those people were properly considered civilians under these this, this release of information because it doesn't come with identifying information. So the, the mission of Reprieve, I just wanted to read, um, helps people suffering extreme human rights abuses at the hands of the most powerful governments. Um, you're a nonprofit organization of lawyers and investigators assisting those facing detention without trial, execution, and extrajudicial killing. Um, your clients are on death row at Guantanamo in secret detention, or they are the civilian victims of unlawful drone killing, unable to pay a lawyer. They would typically go undefended without reprieve. Um, and Reprieve U.S. focuses on cases that help reshape U.S. policy debate in line with international human rights. And I'm just, you know, just for clarity, because, I mean, I've done a lot of shows on Guantanamo, who's in Guantanamo, closing Guantanamo, who was scheduled to be released in Guantanamo, um, you know, who's not a threat, who, you know, who should have been released, you know, in 2009 and still hasn't been. And a lot of people, they, you know, there's so many myths that people that are in Guantanamo or even Rikers Island or anywhere, you know, deserve to be in there. Um, like, you know, the first half an hour. Um, I mean, actually, the one one man who did deserve to be in there, who was like a, a sex predator, and but while he was in there, lost uh, his legs and fingers due to uh, medical neglect, mm -hmm. and is now suing the facility. But uh, I mean, it's not always the case that people in Guantanamo or in these places belong there and people that are being droned are terrorists. Exactly, exactly. One of our clients lost his brother-in-law, who was actually an imam at the local mosque, and he was preaching anti-Al-Qaeda messages three days before he was drone struck by a U.S. drone. So we certainly agree with that. Um, so let me go to uh, your page... Right. This is what we're going to be talking about in this um, perhaps 45 minutes or so. America's Deadly Drone Program, which is on your website. Uh, so what, you know, right, drones are unmanned aerial vehicles. They've become the President Obama's weapon of choice in the ever-expanding war on terror. Uh, they're flown by pilots sitting safely in Nevada an air-conditioned um, kind of, I believe, trailer-type um, buildings. And they these remotely piloted aircraft have the ability to hover over communities 24 hours a day and to target, kill, and kill those below at the mere push of a button. Exactly. Um, and so the CIA drone program is both the next phase in the so-called yeah, so war on terror and the death penalty without trial. Reprieve is therefore working to expose and challenge the covert program. Um, you know, again, like I, I just wanted to mention that I, I've done 
um, quite a bit of shows in the three years and interview a lot of people on the so-called wars and um, journalists, investigators, people who write about, teach about this stuff, um, have said time and time again, uh, terrorism is getting worse. The idea is not to uh, get rid of terrorists, but to actually fund it and to keep it going because, again, the weapons industries, they make a lot of profit off of Mm -hmm. uh, using drones and other kinds of weapons. And a lot of innocent people are being killed. Right, exactly. We've heard that too. Um, But fortunately, some senior military officials uh, understand that when you drone strike a community and kill a bunch of innocent civilians, the only counterterrorism effect that has is actually to hinder your efforts in terms of turning those who were otherwise pro-American or sort of apathetic to America, anti-American. And even in the village where we have a, a U.S. district court case pending, um, which is now on appeal for one of our clients, and we, we know for a fact, just from personal experience, having gone there and spoken to folks who live there, that there was a lot of anti-American sentiment after um, our client's family was killed because everyone was thinking, like, who are these terrorists, these Americans who are essentially right. drone bombing these innocent civilians who are actually speaking out against al-Qaeda? They, they clearly do not know who they're killing. So it's actually had quite a counterproductive effect. And so to just be sort of droning people, again, without any, um, you know, due process... Right, right. Yeah, it, it definitely contravenes any sort of American notion that you or I might consider that we would be, that we would have the benefit of if we were hauled into court somewhere. We would have a, a trial. We would be, you know, given an attorney. But because these folks are non citizens who are outside of the United States and its territories, they don't have the type of constitutional rights that you and I have. Um, and if they're poor and people of color, what they often have is essentially the full might of the U.S. government bearing down on them. And sometimes that means drone strikes in their village. Uh, so, again, just to sort of um, read a little bit about how broad the definition of a terrorist is, according to the U.S., I'm just going to read this paragraph um, entitled, Why are drones so problematic? Um, to date, it says the U.S. has used drones to execute without trial thousands of people in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia, all countries against whom it has not declared war. The U.S. drone program is a covert war being carried out by the CIA. For communities living under drones, life is filled with constant terror Nobody knows who the next target might be. Armed drones can hand down a death sentence simply because a person exhibited suspicious behavior. Yet what that behavior is, the U.S. refuses to say. Other times, the the death sentence comes simply because the person fell within the targeted demographic. All males aged 18 to 65. According to the U.S., these men are not deemed civilian unless they can prove their innocence post-hum- posthumously. That, is that, that means after they die? No, right, that- exactly. So the administration has been putting out information over the course of the last few years that has contradicted itself and in most cases has been anonymous, so we can't hold it accountable. That's exactly right, that within the last... 10 years or so of its drone wars, uh, the information that folks who are 18 and over uh, have been counted as military-aged males and therefore combatants, enemy combatants killed in action. Um, and then separately from that, the idea that uh, that actually everyone, so recently um, when the drone numbers and information came out last Friday, the information that dropped was, was the first time we've heard that information contradicted. But what they did What they didn't contradict is the idea that you must be proven innocent after death. So it's actually a bit worse than the idea that only 18 to 65-year-old males are considered militants because now, as it stands, everyone is considered an enemy combatant killed in action unless there is some way to prove you innocent of that status after you've died, which, of course, considering what we know is non-existent 
we, we don't have a say in that. The families don't have a say in that. There is no proceeding afterwards. If there is a post-strike investigation, the community is not involved. And there is, um, I mean, people have actually come to the U.S. to try to find out why their family members were killed. Um, so, again, under the um, title of why should people care about U.S. using drones to execute without trial some 4,700 people that we know of, the ramifications of the escalating drone age are terrifying for all of us. Um, communities in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia are terrorized daily by the presence of drones. Uh, the U.K. government and U.K. companies are actively... So it's the U.K. government and also, right, U.K. companies are actively complicit in this covert <clears throat> war through intelligence sharing um, the activities of U.S. bases on British soil without any transparency or accountability to the British public as well as the uh, U.S. public and through investigation, litigation, and education, people at Reprieve, like yourself, are working to bring about transparency and accountability on behalf of those affected by drone strikes. And so a Noor Khan, um, his father, Malik Daud Khan, was a Pakistani tribal elder who you were um, speaking about um, a little bit ago and a mediator for the local disputes, and he and 40 other tribal elders who were right, standing up to Al-Qaeda, were killed in a U.S. drone strike that targeted a meeting to convene um, to resolve a dispute. Um, and they were actually, um, uh, right, they're standing up to Al-Qaeda. And so in, and people expected him to be killed by Al-Qaeda, and instead he was killed by a U.S. drone strike. Right, so you can kind of ask a question that you already know the answer to, um, which is how well is this policy going in terms of counterterrorism? Are we inspiring it? Are we counteracting it? For every um, alleged Al-Qaeda cell that we destroy, how many new cells are we creating by the accidental civilian deaths? Um, I mean, we, we truly believe that in terms of what we understand to be the government's policy of targeting people based on their metadata, based on their cell phone activity, the idea that you switch a SIM card in and out of your phone because if you're in uh, rural Yemen, you don't have access to phone chargers, to electricity in the same way that you or I do. So they're constantly having multiple cell phones and therefore switching one SIM card from cell phone to cell phone to cell phone. And that sort of basic cultural facet is being targeted, is being put into a data system that is taken as that one piece of information along with others that leads a person to be targeted for a drone strike by the United States. So. Yeah, it is a pretty broad definition. Um, and, I mean, I, I know that, um, you know, after all of these wars, um, uh, supposedly against Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda actually ended up getting larger, and I think that's actually the same for ISIS today. Um, yeah, we've definitely seen an increase over the years in terms of growth of these organizations. Um, whether you can attribute it to drone strikes or U.S. foreign policy writ large, or just the movement of the tides. Um, it's certainly not helping. Um, our, our general policy is that, yes, of course, terrorism is a problem. We agree. We don't want anyone to die. We can agree with the government on that fact. But what we absolutely stand behind is that this drone policy is hurting their efforts to curb the problem. Um, and in May of 2013, Reprieve achieved a significant victory before the Peshawar High Court in Pakistan in a case brought on um, behalf of several drone strike victims. The court declared U.S. drone strikes in Pakistan illegal and ordered the Pakistani government to take a series of steps to stop future strikes. Right, right. We have litigation going in a few different countries with uh, different levels of success. Um, so the government of Pakistan or rather the judiciary of Pakistan, 
very greatly was able to acknowledge the problem. And I think that they, maybe more so than the actual administration of Pakistan, are in tune with how the civilians are feeling about the general policy and how it's impacting their livelihoods. Um, so the unfortunate incident with that is unlike U.S. courts, um, their judiciary doesn't hold the same type of power over their executive that ours does. Um, so where our courts are actually currently kicking all of these challenges out, they don't want to hear them. They call them political questions. They say essentially a political question is, if you have a problem with this policy, elect a new president, um, which, of course, is an enormously muddled process that we all know too well, considering our current election. Um, but where we can have successes in, in other countries, um, our intent is to sort of levy them against others and say, look, you know, these people have acknowledged the enormous problem that this is. What are you willing to do about it? Um, but, you know, it, it also comes with the everyday challenges. So we could we could theoretically bring tons of cases in Yemen. We have many clients and families who lost loved ones to the U.S. drone program. But as the current situation in Yemen is deteriorated, our ability to bring these cases is extremely limited. And honestly, our focus is not to break down laws, to build it. Whereas the U.S. has such an enormous infrastructure that it's, inarguably overpowered, um, we want them to stand accountable, but we are at a loss in terms of the way the laws are written. <sighs> um, you know, I mean, it, it seems pretty, I mean, you know, like the wars are just ongoing, you know, like, like what is the end goal? I mean, clearly, right. If, if, if the goal is to combat terrorism, I mean, um, they're not doing that. Right. Right, right. Um, I mean, you know, so it's like they're not they're not seeking to learn from their mistakes. Yeah, it's extremely problematic and um as much as we think it's a it's a completely failed program, it is admittedly hard to suggest a different strategy. I mean on a very personal level completely separate from Reprieve's, like, organizational stance. I think that there's lots of community building that needs to be going on in these countries. The infrastructure that's lacking is clearly leading to the enormous rise in violence and just utter discontent, and that what needs to happen is that money needs to be channeled into these places for education and health care and really basic needs. And then people you know, don't turn to such extreme ends. But if we if we don't stop drone striking their villages, they have absolutely no capacity to do those things. I mean, you know, people do have rights. I, I mean, you know, like you, you can't just go blowing up whoever you feel like it. I mean, even though um, that's what, you know, th this government is doing. And th the wars are, pr I mean, they're pretty much illegal, these wars that the United States is carrying out. Exactly. And our stance is and remains that they are contrary to international humanitarian law, and international human rights law, which is known as the law of war. So the government in our, in uh, relevantly our current case in the uh, DC circuit courts um, has argued that, um, so our, the drone strike in question took place in Yemen in 2012. The U S government was not at war with Yemen in 2012. Why? And Yemen was certainly not in the state that it is now in 2012. Um, so we argue that international humanitarian law should apply, which is to say not the law of war, the law of peace, in which case um, a, a foreign government cannot take lethal action against a threat unless that threat presents an imminent threat to American life or property. And uh, they cannot evade capture. So in our particular case, um, the two family members, my client, were killed or within 2.5 kilometers of a Yemeni military base. So the idea that they could not be just captured as opposed to killed is frankly absurd. Um, and then, of course, is the idea that they did not present an imminent threat to American anything for that matter. Um, and then if you take if you take the government's argument, which they presented, which is that they there was a state of active hostilities so they're sort of blurring the lines between what is war and what is not war. So even if you take that argument, you say, okay, fine. 
Yemen was at war because America considers all countries who are not itself at war because they have a higher level of violence or whatever it is, then in that case, the government had to abide by the international law principles of distinction and proportionality, in which case they had to distinguish between civilians and combatants, which they did not. And they had to um, they had to take their strike into consideration regarding the proportionality of damage that would occur. So the idea that there are civilian casualties. So in this particular case, the three there were five people killed, and the three unknown people who are not our clients approached the village and had to pass through multiple military checkpoints in order to get there. So the idea that the government didn't distinguish between those three and our clients is is just frankly illegal because they were they definitely had the capacity to strike those three individuals before they reached the village where there were civilians where there was an anti al Qaeda preacher. So you know, whichever way you slice it, it's illegal. And so what are the chances of holding anybody in the US government accountable for these war crimes? It sort of depends on how you define accountable, uh, not to be an attorney about it. Um, we tend to think that it's much easier to to win a case of public opinion than it is to win a legal case in the United States because the, the laws were written by those in power to serve those in power. Mm-hmm. So our objective is primarily to raise the case, to, to make all of our legal points according to international law that the U.S. thinks it's not bound to. And then to sort of bring that home to the television sets of your everyday American and get them to understand what's going on, what's being done in their name. Right. Um, the transparency, because right now there's, I mean, there's absolutely no transparency as far as, you know, who's being killed. Right, exactly. And we contend that, you know, after three years of humming and hawing about how they were going to come clean about what was going on, the idea that they drop a number as low as 64 since 2009 without countries, without dates, without names is not transparency. It's something we're grateful for. We're grateful for things, for everything, but it's utterly inadequate. Um, and it's um, in the email that I get from the Institute for Public Accuracy um, it talks about the names and faces of the civilians that have been killed. Um, and in a recent announcement, it tells of, well, it tells actually nothing about 14 year old Fahim Qureshi, who was severely injured in Obama's first drone strike. Reports suggest Obama knew he had killed civilians that day. Uh, is Fahim's family in those numbers? They make no mention of nine-year-old Nabila Rahman. She traveled all the way to the U.S. in 2013 to try to get answers about the strike that killed her grandmother, Mamana Bibi. Uh, Will she now get the same apology as an American and an Italian hostage killed in another strike? Right, exactly. And Fahim and Nabila are both reprieve clients and... Uh, Nabila was able to travel to the U.S. in 2013, along with Faisal bin Ali Jabber, who is the plaintiff in our current ongoing U.S. litigation. And they both, uh, being people of color who are not Western, have not received an apology from the president. They have not received an offer for an independent investigation into the deaths of their loved ones. Um, when the drone numbers were released, Faisal issued a statement saying, the administration didn't consider, this is a paraphrase, but he, he basically said the administration didn't consider consulting the families of those who killed. He didn't consider reaching out to them in advance of this public statement. He didn't name them. They're not numbers. They're people. Exactly. I mean, the, yeah, the primary problem here is that it's a dehumanizing way to, to falsely express a number of civilian casualties. But at the very least, um, one would expect names, countries, dates, etc. And there is another um, link in the email that I have from um, from Reprieve uh, 
it's a a press release. Um, it, it has the drone death figures. Shows the U.S. simply does not know who it has killed. Um, it responding to civilian casualty figures released by the White House today. International Human Rights Organization right reprieve has express dismay at how little Obama administration appears to know who it's killed. Um, for three years now, Obama has been promising to shed light on the CIA's covert drone pro- program. Today he had a golden right, golden opportunity, and he did it. Oh, so I think, hopefully, that's a caller. Hello? Hey. Is this Brandon? Yay, thank you for calling in, Brandon Bryant. Um, you're in the, the documentary movie called Drone. Correct. And we're on um, with Shelby Bennis with Reprieve discussing the U.S. drone um, program. So, yeah, please just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what it was like to be a remote drone operator and why you came out about it. Um, well, the second part's a little complicated, but, uh, what it's like to be a drone operator is, um, a lot of watching things. It's a lot of time spent hunting human beings down in the very most literal sense where you get to know your target, you, you watch what they do, you, um, watch, you know, their friends and their family and, uh, you know, their activities, their patterns of life. And um, it's it's strange in the sense that we we nowadays we don't think that it's weird, but um, it it really is kind of uh, strange to be able to give our military the capability of of doing this um, from the opposite side of the world. Um, and uh, if if that makes any sense. So, um. So in, in speaking with um, Shelby, right, and, and just referring to the articles um, on Reprieve and the reports that are on there, um, you know, and just saying that the, the U.S. really has no idea who they're killing. I mean, someone, I mean, of course, the people at the bottom know who are being killed. And um, it actually says in the article on the Reprieve website that, um, the court that held that the U.S. government is bound to compensate all the victims' families and that the Pakistani government should take steps to ensure that this happens immediately. Um, I'm mean, Michelle, uh, or, or any, right, is anyone aware of any compensation? Yeah, so... Uh, I, 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 don't believe, I don't believe the U.S. government in... Um, really cares about compensating anyone for its war on, on whatever it believes to be terror. Uh, and the reason being is because the U.S. government doesn't think that it's wrong. Uh, if you look at the article that came out, uh, the numbers that the U.S. government said were innocent people that were killed or civilians being killed was only 64 to uh, 64 civilians. Uh, that's, that's definitely not in the interest of compensating people for, for what anything lost, you know? Shall yeah, we? agreed, Brandon. Um, the only cases that we know of were cases that essentially came from shaming the administration in terms of bringing folks over to the U.S. or having some sort of litigation strategy where we had a ton of press going. So they're absolutely under no circumstances compensating people regularly for their deaths in the same way uh, that, say, under Army regulations, if someone is killed by a, a, a U.S. Army guy in Afghanistan and, like, accidentally goes off base and shoots a bunch of civilians, those folks actually get compensated under that regime. But because of this secret program of U.S. drone strikes, the only way that our clients have ever, ever been compensated in the three cases that we know of have been secretly. So essentially one of our clients got um, $100,000 in sequentially marked 
U.S. dollars in a big plastic bag. Um, and he wasn't told who they were from or why he was getting them, but it, it seems fairly obvious that they came from the U.S. government. I mean, he was given them by the Yemeni security officials. So in terms of compensation, we heard that the administration was, for the first time ever, considering compensating the innocent people that it kills, um, which is news to us. You know, yeah. Go ahead, Brian. The whole, the whole thing is very, very um, and wrong, I guess, is, is how I would uh, say it. So that it gives the uh, administration kind of this ability to say, well, we're doing what we can for what we believe is the information under the information that we do have, and yet the information that they do have is shoddy or fraudulent at best. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of don't really believe that uh, many of the people that are doing this are doing it out of evil design. Um, I think that people are just trying to cover their asses. Uh, that, like, uh, instead of doing it as something of like, well, uh, we don't believe that we're being evil or, or whatever, uh, we're doing the right thing, I think that they're just trying to lessen the effect of it for the, the human or the, the U.S. population because the U.S. population doesn't care or want to know that we're still in war after however many years we've been at war. If I, if I could just interrupt just for a minute. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so, um, Brandon, let me just ask you, like, what is your take? Um, and can you talk a little bit about the drones actually, right, creating more terrorists. All right. Uh, when you want me to start. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, that's kind of the, the sad thing about this, the whole drone program is um, I, I've been quite a bit around Europe and uh, talking with people who have been affected by the drone program and what it means to them and through I talked to a lady whose husband and brother were killed and I talked to um, another person who um, had been in a drone strike uh, one of the victims and uh, it's it's really sad to see that what we're doing is creating a lot of confusion and in order to seek answers or if they can't get their answers on to why then they're just going to they get angry and, and hurt us and attack us if that's what it means. Um, so their response is to join up with an organization or any organization that says that, well, we'll get you justice, we'll make you feel better about what has happened and uh, uh, those so the, the, re- the things that things give back to us is just violence. Exactly. Um, those, those organizations care for nothing other than their own design. I mean, there is a profit motive with all of the, uh, you know, the, co- the companies, that, the weapons industries that make all these weapons. Um, well, the weapons industries... Uh, I just hear an echo of my soul. You know, I mean, you, you sound fine to me. Um, um, so I, I was just hearing an echo of myself. Um, but uh, the weapons industry, uh, if you look at General Hayden's reaction to us coming out in November and talking about in the, all the drone operators, me as a drone operator and the drone technician, um, his response was everything was okay, but no one really comes to realize that in the New York Times article, they don't mention that he's also being paid and working for some of these weapons manufacturers that uh, are building drones. So why wouldn't he say everything's okay? Everything's fine. We're doing everything uh, right. In, said. Um, in terms of uh, monetary incentive, my our perspective as reprieve is that in other 
basically in other countries where the shareholders of these organizations may be concerned about where their money is going. That just tends to not be the case in the U.S. Um, we've, con we've considered taking legal action against war profiteers, for lack of a better term. Um, but frankly, it's not lucrative. There's no legal mechanism for it. Um, and the shareholders don't they don't have that sort of folks who are investing in Honeywell know what they're investing in. Um, so in terms of uh, a strategy, we've sort of looked elsewhere for strategies. Um, but I agree with Brandon generally that the folks who are doing this are not doing this out of some malintent. They're doing it because they think they're doing the right thing. And I think we specifically as like termed lefty organizations or individuals should really be careful in terms of how we demonize folks on that end. Um, and speaking to them. And I know that like a lot of activist organizations have the best of intents, but, um, but frankly, these are people on both ends of the spectrum and that we need to really consider that when we think about strategy, when we think about intent, um, when we think about how to reach the opposition, um, even just seeing some of these senior military figures come out against the program is really inspiring. Um, and I think certainly the people who are lower on the end of that spectrum are even more reachable if you if you're willing to speak to them with respect. Um, and I mean, I, I was just going to ask, you know, because again, and when when you know when you can see that their objective is not working, and you know, more uh, you know, so-called terrorists or whatever are being created. I mean, you know, you have to kind of admit somewhere along the line that you're, what you're doing is not working. Yeah. You know? Well, that's why I believe that they're deluding themselves instead of being evil about it because um, right, like just there's not, so much money being invested into it that they want it to work. Yeah, like, I mean, right, there's sort of this like un subconscious, um, you know, drive, you know, of, um, you know, they're not acknowledging it. I mean, and not admitting, I mean, if you're wrong, you know, you admit that you're wrong. You admit that something is not working. And if right. Like the core values of the Air Force are, you know, integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. And yet, um, with this program, none of the Air Force core values are actually being addressed. Uh, I mean, again, you know, I do you know, quite a, a, a bit of shows interviewing like different people. And it's, and it's sort of, you know, the same um, kind of theme. I mean, money is pretty much, uh, profit is pretty much kind of unspokenly what's driving most things these days. You know, mm -hmm. the prison system, the, uh, the you know, the so-called justice system. I mean, there's a profit motive really like behind a lot of things. And, you know, I mean, of course, I mean, the, the fact that problems are not getting solved, I mean, if people really want to solve the problems, you're going to look at the evidence and the facts and take that into consideration. And if they just disregard the evidence and the facts and continue doing what they're doing, then, you know, it's, um, you know, we'll just be, uh, hopefully, I mean, not going on with this for too much longer. Um, I mean, does any, I mean, either from either one, Brandon or Shelby, um, where do you see things going, um, improving or, or, or not improving as far as, no. you know, ending the wars? I, I'm not sure if ending the war is even a possibility at this point, um, because, so many people are stuck in that cost fallacy mentality. We've invested so much money into this, we might as well keep going. You know? um, but as far as, I don't see, I see the drone program kind of stagnating even further than it already has um, and not getting any better. Uh, uh, I see it as being something that is continuously misused until people start realizing that this is now the new face of war. This is how we're always going to execute war. Soon we might not even have boots on the ground at all. And then what does that mean for us as a species? And then, then of course, the perpetual war thing keeps happening. 
Yeah. And it also the environmental um, ramifications of these never-ending wars. Yeah, well, if there's profit to be had that means those resources to be uh, used up, and um, that means that you know, it's hitting on something that you want, and we're going to take it because we need it, and it's not going to get any better. Well, I, I just want to thank you both, uh, Brandon Bryant, who was a remote drone operator who is um, now traveling around and speaking to people about his experiences. And you can actually get um, PTSD even as a drone, uh, remote drone operator. And um, thank you also for joining me, uh, Shelby Bennis of Reprieve, an international human rights organization that has studied U.S. government drone killings. Uh, maybe we'll find a um, political solution. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Shelby. Thank you, Brian, Bra Brandon. Thanks for calling in. Okay. All right. Good night. Okay, so this is a recorded interview with... Uh, Dr. Margaret Flowers, who is um, with the popularresistance.org and is also running for senator with the Green Party. And um, so I've interviewed you before, Margaret, so welcome back. This time it is for the People's Internet Radio. Great. Thank you for having me, Kat. Um, and I, I, I got an in email from, right, Margaret Flowers for Senate. And I just wanted to read because, you know, of course, 4th of July was just yesterday. And just in case, you know, a lot of people don't even really know um, about Independence Day and who, you know, we are independent from. Um, and I really liked this email. So I wanted to just read what it says. Uh, July the 4th is the day we celebrate the Declaration of Independence, which freed the 13 colonies that made up the United States of America from British rule. At the time, Britain was the largest empire in the world. Settlers in the U.S. not only separated themselves from the British government, but also from the British corporations that were exploiting them, dominating trade and extracting their wealth. The colonists demand the right to create a government that protects protected their safety and happiness, which meant creating their own system of governance and restricting corporate power. There are many parallels between that era and our own today. People in the U.S. are subject to a government that works hand in hand with large corporations that exploit our labor, health, and our ability to meet our basic needs. We could write a long list of grievances, low wages, attacks on unions, unaffordable health care, contamination of the environment, failing infrastructure, lack of access to high quality education, mass incarceration, systemic racism, the ongoing genocide of indigenous people, assaults on our civil liberties, endless wars, and more. The current political system is controlled by two parties, the corporate duopoly that overwhelmingly represents the interests of the wealthy funders rather than the people. Just as the founders said, there comes a point when one must dissolve the political bands that connect them with another. They go on to write that governments gain their legitimate legitimacy from the consent of the governed and that when they become abusive, people have a right to create a new system. Uh, and then it just goes on to say the we cannot continue down the road mapped out by the corporate duopoly. Uh, it's a, a road to greater poverty, more wars and climate chaos. And we need to create a government that works for all of us. And we can start by withdrawing our consent from the corporate duopoly. Fewer people are registered as either Democrat or Republican than I've ever um, than than sorry, than there have been since. The data started being recorded 75 years ago and more independents or members of third parties more than ever. And um, so, yes, please go to, um, sorry, the link, yes, uh, flowersforsenate.org. So thank you, um, Margaret. I just had to read that email. Thank you, Kat. 
Um, so I've always seen you at a lot of protests, protests in D.C. against, uh, I, I believe, you know, closing Guantanamo, you know, for closing Guantanamo and things like that. Um, so what made you, or I guess that's a, a silly question, it's kind of obvious, I guess, what made <laughs> you want to run for senator? Um, so, yeah, that's talk. I mean, it is. Talk I about the talking. issues, the issues. The issues, okay. Are the issues of why I'm running? Yeah, the, the, I mean, the issues of, of, of what you want to focus on or um, I know there's there's so many of those too. Yeah, well, I mean, in general, um, I guess I need to start out with why I'm running because I've been doing, you know, social movement work for a long time now, starting around single payer, and then we've been fighting the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, for the last five years. We've been involved in a lot of environmental justice and climate justice issues and economic issues, racial justice. So, um, you know, I, I never wanted to run for office before because I felt like the movement work was so critical, but at some point, you need to start having a political arm of that movement, and um, this just seemed like a really opportune time. It's really amazing that so many people, so many more people, are starting to get it. Um, that you know, the, the whole political system is very corrupt. It's very rigged. That our government does not represent the interests of the people. It, it represents the interests of the wealthy and so we have to build that alternative outside of the two corporate parties like the last time that we had a successful third party in the united states was back in the 1860s when president lincoln was elected as a republican and that killed off the Whig party the issue back then was slavery and the republican party was an abolition party so that we have a similar situation now where this, the issue of the day is kind of corporate power or the power of the wealthy versus the power of the people. And we have two pro-corporate parties, the Democrats and Republicans. And the only way we're going to beat that is if we create an, a party of the people that's not corporate, that, um, you know, really is a grassroots democracy that, you know, is founded in the values that the movement is founded in. And that's why I think this is such an opportune time. So few people are. Democrats and Republicans now they're shrinking and the independent side is growing and we have to turn that into a political party nationally and, and I think this is just a really amazing time. We have an open Senate seat here in Maryland that I'm running for, so I'm not facing an incumbent, which is often a big challenge. And I think, you know, Jill Stein's campaign is really exciting too at the national level for president and we have so many Greens running in Maryland and across the country. It's really an exciting time. And uh, are you, because the picture right on Flowers for Senate, it's it's a picture of you and Jill Stein. Um, so you're not, are you involved with her in any way? Well, yeah, I mean, it's no secret that Jill Stein and I are friends. Yeah. And I, you know, helped her campaign back in 2012. And then we founded the Green Shadow Cabinet, which was um, kind of, you know, a a play on if her, if she had been elected, who would she have put in various positions, of cabinet positions, but we also kind of created our some of our own that we thought were important, uh, like a Department of Peace. And, um, and so we were able to kind of comment on what was going on through that, through the Green Shadow Cabinet, and provide an alternative viewpoint, keep the dialogue going. And this year I am, uh, have the honor of being selected as an honorary co-chair of the Presidential Nominating Convention uh, in Houston for the Green Party, and Jill is the presumptive nominee. She has won enough votes uh, to be the nominee. Uh, I mean, I remember at um, one of the last, uh, uh, you know, elections presidential when you know Jill Stein. It was out in um, Long Island at, um, uh, at Hofstra. Right, Hofstra. I was going to say Rutgers, but I knew that wasn't right because it's in New Jersey. <laughs> Um, and I couldn't off the top of my head to remember the name of the school, but right. And they had handcuffed her for eight hours when she tried to get in and actually be a part of the debate. Actually, she was just trying to attend the debate. Oh, we didn't even let her on the campus. And they arrested Jill and her vice presidential candidate, Sherry Hankala, and took them to a, a black site. Basically, they had no idea where they were and held them 
chained to chairs for eight hours and released them in the middle of the night. They had no idea where they were. <laughs> it was so crazy. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, it's um, we definitely, definitely need to change things. I mean, there's no question about it. And so, I mean, how do we do it? Because, I mean, you know, can we overthrow the government? Because it's really not a government anymore. I mean, it's it's a corporate, it's corporations. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, we have academic studies now to, to prove that, that they aren't representing the interests of the people. And, you know, that's part of how nonviolent movements work. We have to kind of, you know, remove our consent from them. We can't legitimize them anymore. Um, and I think that the electoral part is, you know, it's, it's one part of the work that we have to do. Um, and I see a lot happening. I guess what keeps me optimistic is that kind of the ingredients that we need to create real transformational change are here. Um, you know, we're building a movement of movements. The Trans-Pacific Partnership has been a really unifying issue because it impacts everything that we care about. The climate crisis, similarly, is a very unifying issue. Oh, yeah. Kind of the racial injustice that's happening, the economic injustice. All of these are bringing more and more people together. And we're forming a national consensus. If you look at the polling data, more and more people are getting on board with the solutions that we need to have, calling for an end to wars, to a real um, mobilization to deal with the climate crisis, to stopping these um, rigged corporate trade agreements like the TPP and moving to a model of trade that actually lifts up the standards for workers and the environment um, for you know, single-payer health care systems and investing in a new kind of economy that's not a capitalist or a socialist economy, but it's kind of um, an economy that is, we call it a democratized economy where people have more power over the economy and benefit from it. There's like a lot of consensus forming around these issues. And so we think it's really imperative to do a number of things. You know, one is building an alternative party. And right now the Green Party is well poised to be that at the national level. There are other parties on the left and, and certainly, you know, we work with Socialist Alternative and other parties and, and feel like we should be working together uh, for a common platform and elect more candidates. Um, but also kind of that we can no longer let the elites set the agenda, the political agenda. Right. And so we're also organizing the No Lame Duck Uprising this fall because if they try to move forward with sneaking ratification of the TPP through after the election during the Lame Duck Congress, we have to be in there as people protesting and not allowing that to proceed. And then we need to continue that into the new year. Whoever's elected, popular movement needs to be there making the demands of what we want to have on the table. That's how we're going to you know, create this change we need. Um, so I just kind of thought about um, former Senator Mike Gravel. Uh, when I, I interviewed him and he has this whole uh, direct democracy, you know, um, trying to help to make and, and give the people the power to make laws. Yeah, I mean, I think we really need to move in that direction. And, um, and I think it, it, I think he was talking about more of a national type of thing. And I do see ways that people can participate much more fully at the national level, like uh, I know if I become senator that I will be regularly seeking input from my constituents and communicating with them in a very transparent way about the choices that we have to make, um, you know, and, and enlisting their help and, and demanding what we need. But I think that, you know, there's a lot that can be done starting at the local level with people having, a, you know, community assemblies and figuring out what the problems are and what the solutions are they would like to see moving forward and then government should be working hand in hand with them to provide the resources so they can solve those solutions and you can see that happening you know expanding uh and happening more at the at, you know counties together and states you know the whole statewide and then maybe forming regional types of assemblies you know i think this is something that we aspire to a more participatory democracy and it's something that we're going to have to learn how to practice here in the United States. Exactly. Right. Practice. That's a good word to use because we definitely have to get more used to, uh, you know, having a system that works for us. And 
you know, I, I, I worry sometimes that like so many people have, um, you know, given up or just resorted or just like feel so powerless. I mean, I, I don't want that. I mean, I, I hope that that's not the case. I mean, it might be for some people, but I guess if we have enough people that, that, you know, can feel empowered. So, I mean, who can blame people when they yeah. see how rigged the system is and how difficult, you know, this work to change it is? So, I, I you know, I, I sympathize with people that feel despair. I think many of them are, are highly aware people. Um, but one of the really amazing things about being uh, active as an activist is that really it is kind of an antidote to that despair because you're doing what you can to try to change the system. And, and also, a really exciting thing about uh, places that have used this participatory democracy in terms of like participatory budgeting, where they, they give a portion of the budget. Usually this is happening in a city, and it may be that one alderman or one council member gives a portion of the budget they have control over to the community to decide how to use it. And when that happens, it really engages the community. People come out that are, that are not usually active. They, you know, talk about what they'd like to see in their community. They create proposals. They vote on it. And they're actually the ones who decide how that money is spent. And then it gives them a whole different perspective and connection to their community because they're part of, you know, creating the vision, creating what they want to have. And so I think these types of things, if we can move to them, would be very empowering for people as well as giving them the resources they need to solve problems in their communities. And things got to be the way that they are. I mean, you know, what happened to the government? I mean, it's it's supposed to be that, I guess, firewall, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, at least, at least prov provide some regulation to corporations. I mean, we're at a point now where, you know, like, you know, people are a criminal if they get in the way of, of corporate profit. I mean, it's... Tell me about it. Down in Southern Maryland, um, we're trying to stop a, the first uh, gas export terminal from being built on the East Coast. It's a refinery and export terminal being put right in the middle of a neighborhood. It's really outrageous because normally there's a buffer zone protecting them. And Dominion, the company that's building it, actually pays the county police their full salary for 10 or 11 sheriffs, special ops sheriffs, who are basically working for Dominion. And so when we go down there and, you know, protest what's happening, they're on the side of the corporation and not on the side of protecting our First Amendment rights or us. So it's, it's really, that's a very kind of uh, upsetting type of arrangement because they see it as this really awesome new way that corporations and the government can work together. It's another thing that we really need to, to stop. You know, and this is where the parallel comes into when we were, you know, seeking independence from the British. And I, I, I have a lot of issues with that whole era because it was not, you know, a simple issue. I mean, we came to this land as settlers and very violently stole it. And the kind of elites that wrote the Constitution wrote it in a way that, to make it very anti-democratic and to make sure that property, you know, landowners had control. But if you look at what was happening during that era before the elites took control, was that the people who had come here were building their own local economies and trying to get away from being controlled by the corporations that were, you know, really determining everything, labor and what goods they could have. And so after that revolution, they put in place a whole system to control corporations where they were only given very limited charters with very specific goals that they were supposed to have. And that was a way to control corporate power. But now we're in the complete opposite situation where corporations are out of control and they're controlling. Oh, yeah, they are way out of control. I mean, um, uh, I mean, you know, addiction is... Mm -hmm. one Money. Money. You know, I mean, you know, I'm talking about addiction, like, like, like substance abuse. I, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I majored in psych. I've, I've always was very passionate about the subject of mental health for the very reason that it always seemed to be so taboo, but I always found it completely fascinating and no different than your physical health and, you know, and, you know, fitness, like, mental fitness, you know, because I could always feel at a young age that 
people around me were not very fit. Like they, they weren't, um, I, I, you know, I mean, there, there was not this, this kind of mentality where you could kind of be whatever you wanted or, you know, you, you were, you were basically just kind of people accepted that they were just going to have jobs pay bills and just kind of stay more or less at a certain level and not really ever reach a certain level of kind of uh, the happiness or, you know, the, 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 the kind of success and happy life that you're really entitled to. And, you know, that's always kind of what woke me, me up, you know, it's like, where, where's the mentality of, you know, growing to your full potential? Right, right. I think that's a lot of reason why I became a pediatrician. And that shouldn't be a luxury, you know what right. I mean? <laughs> right. Every person should have the access to, you know, support and caring and education and the things that they need really to meet their potential. Imagine what the world would be like and, and felt secure. It, right. And um, I just kind of wanted to make the point that, um, you know, because what, what's happening, you know, the more corporate profit is taking over, and I, I, I also like to always make sure that I remind people of the fact that money is created out of debt, which is another way the system is rigged to keep people, you know, enslaved. And so the more they water down the money supply, the, the harder people have to work for it, thereby, you know, sacrificing of course, right, your emotional health, which isn't even really kind of, I mean, you know, in my whole life, mental health was never even considered. Ne mm -hmm. I mean, never mind your physical health, you know. I mean, people weren't like even really focused that much on physical health, but never mind like your emotional health. And it's like, no wonder, because, you know, <laughs> It's too busy being like diluted, like for um, corporate profit. Um, yeah, and I think now with the high rates of poverty and you know continued unemployment and low wages and you know really so many of our workers now are in you know just trying to cobble together a number of you know low wage jobs to get by. That's really taking a toll on you know the health, the mental health of people in our communities. Um. So let me see, I was going to bring up, you know, one of the uh, subjects, topics that really is a focus of mine is the for-profit prisons that are mm -hmm. um, kind of popping up all over and, you know, the Correctional Corporation of America. Right. And um, a couple yeah. of weeks ago, I interviewed George Malingrot, who wrote the book Getting Away with Murder about an inmate slash, um, you know, cause right, he was actually in jail because he was mentally ill. So they're criminalizing mental illness and putting them in prison. Yeah, and putting them in solitary confinement, oh. which you shouldn't really even be put in that unless you're very mentally fit. Yeah. And so they, um, they took this inmate, I mean, it, it's like, you know, that the prisons are just basically um, intimidated by the guards. Like the guards are the ones that were running this particular facility. And so they would abuse the, the I, I call them patients. Um, and so they took this one inmate patient, Darren Rainey, and put him in a shower with that was, you know, he had no control over the, the controls were on the outside and the temperature they, they um, figured was 183 degrees. Mm -hmm. So they scolded this guy to death for two hours in this, in this shower. And then the facility covered it up. And it was only because of one inmate who his name was Harold Hempstead who heard the cries of Mr. Rainey, um, who was writing to the Miami Herald and, and all these places over and over and over again, that the story got any notoriety at all. And it just... Yeah, yeah, the whole prison system is a big mess because, it, you know, once you make it for profit, you know, when these prisons sign contracts with governments for to make sure that they meet certain capacity levels like yeah 
percent occupancy for 20 years, and that drives, you know, our policies of policing. And you know, yeah, there's a lot that we need to do. I mean, it's really scary. I mean, that is just one subject that is like I'm literally like I can't even believe that this is what's going on in in America in 2016. Well, you know, if you look at our history, we don't have a very good history. Yeah. Days, and we're just continuing to see that play out today. Exactly. I mean, it, I guess slavery, right, it was always for profit. Right, right. And, uh, and that's what's happening now. You know, it's overwhelmingly African Americans that are uh, imprisoned. And there's the whole issue of, you know, prison labor. And, you know, very cheap labor that many large corporations like Microsoft and IBM and AT&T are using. Um, so that's another incentive you know, for more prisoners. I just don't, you know, so and the police who will, you know, basically criminalize otherwise, you know, normal, healthy behavior, you know, just to whatever feed their pensions or things like that. I mean... You know, that is another um, kind of... It is very corrupt. Here in Baltimore, we have a young man in jail right now, Keith Davis Jr., who was arrested last year. He just happened to be in the area when there was a robbery, and the police decided that he was the one that did it and chased him into a garage and shot at him 44 times and hit him three times, but they didn't kill him. And then they put a gun on him and said he had a gun and put him in jail. And then when, you know, the... The person who was robbed said that he wasn't the one that did it. The gun they put on him hadn't been fired. They couldn't trace his fingerprints to it. You know, there was no evidence that he should be in. So he was acquitted yeah. of 16 of the charges, 17 charges. They pinned a murder charge on him. With, again, absolutely no evidence, nothing to even tie him to the area where the murder happened. But it was just because they didn't want to admit they were wrong. Yeah. They just made up another charge. It's it's really disgusting to see what's happening. And, and of course, here in Baltimore, our prosecutor is not doing anything about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh um, sorry. <laughs> I know. I mean, no, but I'm, it's, I'm, thank you, know, really, just, you know, thank you for saying it, because I, I always got called negative in my life for talking about these things, but you know, again, which is one of the reasons, you know, I, I majored in psych and I, I was trying to get people, I mean, it's, you know, it sounds, and I, I and I do believe that it, it really comes down to basics because I, I, I was trying to always get people to be fit, basic fitness, not just physical, but mental. And I just feel like if there was just like, if people kind of were just basically incorporated just simple fitness into their lives and challenged the system, you know, stood up to, um, you know, like these, these kinds of things wouldn't be going on. Right. Right. If people, and, you, you know, right. Like worked and kept up their health and fitness and mental fitness. And instead of just everything being about money, like that's what I'm saying. It's like, even these cops, that are like criminalizing and framing these innocent people. And like, so that's what I mean about the more the monetary system is diluted, the more people are literally going into like a mental health deficiency just to have a job. Yeah. And it's interesting, the whole concept of, do of debt. I mean, so, um, I don't know if you've ever read the book Rethinking Money by Bernard Lightyear and Jackie Dunn. It's an excellent book if anybody hasn't read it. But one of the things they talk about debt in there and it, a way of looking at it is that you have, you have a pool of money, right? And when somebody borrows money and has to pay interest, it's not like you've created the extra money in that pool of money to pay that interest. Right. That extra interest money has to come from somewhere else. And right. so when you have a debt-based system, there are always people that are eventually going to lose because it's a system that pits people against each other to have to create more money to pay off the debt that they're in. And it's, you know, the, the monetary system, you know, Peter Joseph, right, he illustrates that pretty well in the Zeitgeist Addendum documentary. Um, and, you know, 
th- this is why I always like to talk about, you know, health, fitness, and, you know, nature and the environment, because the way that the monetary system and never-ending corporate profit function, it's in direct conflict with the way that nature works, you know, and my whole life, like all I ever used to do, you know, through health and fitness and mental fitness is try to, you know, always align with the way that nature works and just be as physically and emotionally um, fit and aligned with natural law as possible. And, you know, nature is all about even and equal exchange. I mean, the body is all about even and equal exchange. I mean, carbon dioxide and oxygen are supposed to like evenly and equal exchange. Like the body doesn't say, well, oh, you know, I'm going to try to get um, you know, more oxygen and like, you know, cheat the system out of some carbon dioxide or something like that, or else it would throw off the homeostasis and the balance. Right, right. Well, we definitely are, are upsetting the equilibrium as human beings in a lot of ways. And so, um, like, yeah, like, so what can people do? Well, there's a lot that people can do, fortunately, and that they are doing. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons why we started our organization, Popular Resistance, which is a daily movement news website, and we also provide resources um, to help people see what other people are doing, how they're standing up to change things, both through resisting harmful policies and also creating positive alternatives. Um, so people are, I urge people to go to the popularresistance.org and Check that out. I mean, we see here in Baltimore, it's been really interesting because a few years before the uprising last year, you could definitely feel a lot was changing here, more kind of activism uh, around, you know, trying to change things as well as creating, you know, better economic opportunities for people, you know, more wealth within our communities. And since the uprising, it just really brought everything to a head and people saw that this was really not just about the murder of Freddie Gray, but it was about all of this injustice. Baltimore is a city of firsts, and it's firsts for both good and bad things. We were the first city to do redlining that segregated the city, to do predatory you know, lending, praying, you know, subprime mortgages and things like that. Um, and, and so there's a lot of energy here right now in the city for change. People are talking to each other, organizations are communicating with each other, communities are starting to come out and, and, you know, talk to each other and try to figure out how to change things. And politically, there's a lot of uh, desire here for change as well. We've been a democratically run city for 50 or 60 years. And so people are seeing that, you know, having a democratic government is not the solution. And so the Green Party is really growing here, which is exciting. So I think people just need to get into their communities and talk to each other, see what groups there are. Um, form groups and, and just start to take on issues that they see as well. You know, it's, it is hard. I understand that because, you know, when you say people aren't politically engaged, so many people are working really hard just to, to survive. Um, so we can't blame them for that. But for those who can be active, um, it's, I think it's our responsibility to do that. Yeah, we have to, um, you know, work for real uh, wealth, you know, not like the man-made wealth. <laughs> right. Um, and if, if I could just ask you about, you know, of course, you know, people like Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and, um, you know, I guess what your take on, the, you know, like that either one of them could possibly become president. And I think that, you know, we're in an interesting time where the two major party presidential nominees have the highest negative ratings of any other nominees ever. And I think that this is the result of decades of lesser evil voting yeah. where people hold their nose and are mostly voting against what they don't want instead of what for what they want. Right. And this just created this race to the bottom. And so, you know, I, I you know, if either of them are elected, you know, that's, I guess I look at it that, you know, it's not very likely that Trump is going to be elected, but if he is, He's going to be a very weak president with a Congress that's mostly against him. His own party doesn't even like him. Um, if Clinton is elected, she will actually be a strong president. Most likely she'll have a, a Senate majority. 
and maybe even a House majority on her side, and that's going to allow her to do some really damaging things, um, particularly I'm concerned about her belligerence towards Russia and bringing us into another major war. Um, so, you know, both of them, I think, are it's an interesting, I guess it's an interesting kind of scenario that we have facing us right now. And I think that what it says to me is that people should be rejecting both of them. Don't vote for either. Vote for a third party candidate. And let's build up this alternative. I think people who say they're not going to vote, unfortunately, so many people don't vote already, that that's not going to make any you know difference. It's not going to be noticed. Um, it's more noticed if people go to the ballot box and vote their values instead of voting out of fear. See, that's what I'm saying. Like what you described is, is right. It's like debt based voting. Right. <laughs> you know? And so, I mean, right. I mean, isn't the idea to be on the plus side of life? I mean, you're voting for what you want. That's the only way you get it. And yeah. Like that. Right. Like that's getting out of debt. <laughs> right. Exactly. As opposed to like perpetuating, you know, debt, even in the voting process. But no matter who is elected, like I said earlier, it's got to be up to us, you know, it's up to us to say that we are going to set the political agenda. You know, we had an interesting experience a couple of years ago when the net neutrality fight started and the FCC was getting ready to propose rules that would create a tiered internet that would be able to discriminate based on how much people could pay. And we knew the solution to that was to reclassify the internet as a common carrier so that the government could prevent that and, and could you know, win when there were legal challenges. And we were told by a lot of groups that that's off the table. We don't, you know, that's not going to be a possibility. And we said, well, that's the only way we're going to solve the problems. We have to put it on the table. And we worked together with a lot of groups and we used, you know, strategic protest and we got it on the table and we got it passed within nine months. So that was an example of, of we have to stop accepting what we're told we can have because then we're compromising in situations where we're that we're only losers. We're not gaining anything, and that's what we have to do going forward: is say, no, this is what we must have, and we're going to hound you <laughs> until you do it. Exactly, pressure. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I, I always bring everything back to um, to fitness, mm -hmm. um, but and so the fact that you know Bernie Sanders isn't looking um, well. Actually, let me say that. Trump denies climate change. So, I mean, him getting in, I mean, that would not really... It's going to be a strong precedent. It'll be easier for, you know, people to go against him. It'll be four years of really not much, which is bad, because we need really four years of very significant changes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's it's really getting to, um, to the, the crucial uh, crucial minutes. Yes for us um, to be turning things around. Yeah, particularly with the climate crisis. That exactly. Right. I mean, if there's, a, if there's one thing, and, and, and a lot of people don't believe it, though, you know, too. A lot of people think that climate change isn't. I mean, I don't know. Is that what you find? Because... Well, I think that what we're finding, you know, we were are a very highly propagandized society. We knew that the oil and gas companies were you know, putting a lot of effort into preventing people from understanding what's going on. But I think it's just getting more and more obvious. And, it, and also the polls are showing that more people get it now. But you don't need everybody to get it. Right, and that's right. the interesting thing about, you know, nonviolent social movements over time. When you look at them, they've been studied. You only need a small portion of the population to be activated to create significant change. They say 3.5% of the population activated is all that you need when you have a consensus on an issue. And so that's what we've got to recognize, that we have a lot of power as people that we are not using as strategically as we could, and that's what we need to start doing a little bit better. And I mean, people are working on it, and I would say that this culture of resistance is really growing and maturing in this country. Um, when you see you know, people like Karenna Gore getting arrested, you know, really legitimizing, uh, you know, direct action. There's a town, I think it was in Ohio, or Pennsylvania, that legalized direct action. Um, we're really seeing a change in our culture of resistance, which is good. Yeah, people need to realize that it's it's your right to 
to protest, you know, and it's your right to overthrow your government if they're not in your interest. Right. Hopefully in a way that creates a stable alternative afterwards. <laughs> That's our goal is to, you know, shift the political power so that we can get the transformative change that we need, uh, but in a way that's sustainable. And so, I mean, I would definitely love to see Jill Stein get in. I voted for Jill the, in the last election. Um, I mean, wh what do you think? Um, I mean, do you think she has a good chance? You know, I think that voting for third parties is uh, important, even if you think that you're, you know, the person you vote for is not going to win. Um, because what we're doing is we're building this over the long term. You know, when she ran... Four years ago, she got, you know, I think less than 500,000 votes. Um, now she's polling at like 7%. And I think that as more, you know, which is 2,000 times more than what she was, what she got in, in 2012. And, you know, there's also polls showing that the majority of people in the U.S., over 80% of people don't even know that she exists. So right. that's, you know, I think as her, she's starting to get more media attention. Yeah. So. Um, she's really, I think we're going to see her grow more in the polls, maybe even get into the presidential debate. That's a tough one, but she's really fighting hard to get into the debate where she can you know, raise these issues that are not otherwise going to be discussed and build the party nationally. I mean, if they get 5% of the vote, they get federal matching funds. That's a huge lift to the party. There's uh, you know, a lot of burden that can be taken off the party if we can win or or gain in the you know votes that we get so there are a lot of reasons why people should be voting third party to help strengthen them um and if you know by some reason she did win you know it's a really interesting time right now um that would be a pretty amazing thing that would be really revolutionary and like as far as um you know because like another one of my um main focuses is the fact that you know, people in power never get held accountable. Like, no one is ever held to account. <laughs> it's a good day to say that on the day that the FBI decided not to prosecute Clinton, even though she committed felony crimes. You know, see, I mean, you know, like, talk about a rigged system. Yep. yep. And, you know, I'm, you know I, I always say natural law trumps man's law because, exactly, I mean, this is ridiculous. Right. <sighs> And um, I just was going to, um, sorry, did, did I interrupt you? Were you going no. to? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so the 10 key values on your website uh, for the, the Green Party, I'm just going to read the, the bold. The, okay. fir the first one is grassroots democracy. The second one is social justice and equal opportunity. The third one is ecological wisdom. The fourth one is nonviolence. The fifth one is decentralization. Uh, six is community-based economics. Seven is feminism and gender equity. Eight, respect for diversity. Nine, personal and global responsibility. And ten is future focus and sustainability. And uh, they sound like really good um, key points. Yeah, those were shaped over a, you know a long time uh, to bring consensus around those. I think it's a really strong foundation for our platform. So, um, so people can go to Flowers for Senate at org dot org, and they can sign up to well. I love donations. Even very small donations would be welcome because I don't take any corporate or PAC money. Uh, and we are running hard uh, to you know, get as many votes as we can. Um, they can also sign up to volunteer. Even if you're not in Maryland, you can help with phone banking remotely. Um, so I encourage people to do that. And just to spread the word about the campaigns and all the green campaigns. There are, I think, 150 or so people running nationwide. Thank you so much, Dr. Margaret Flowers. And I will definitely... Okay, so that does it for this Wednesday, July 6th on the People's Internet Radio. Um, please check out my YouTube channel. It's April and then Waters 
W A T T E R S. Um, we could really use support. Um, there's a link uh, if people really like what they hear and want to help us to have real news. Uh, please do. And there's also my podcast uh, from Awake Radio on YouTube, Awake Radio, and the number one on YouTube. Um, there's also a way to support. So thank you, and please tune in next Tuesday. Have a great night. You're listening to www.peoplesinternetradio.com Seeking Solutions